The movie set around the year 2057, when a group of multinational astronauts are dispatched in a perilous expedition to use a nuclear fission bomb to reignite the fading sun. Spoiler ahead, watch out and have fun. The movie opens around 2050. Dark energy turns out to be responsible for the sun's instability, which would put all life on Earth in danger of a new ice age. According to researchers, a test stellar bomb payload with a mass comparable to Manhattan Island will clear the virus and restore stability to the sun. The laborious duty of conveying the payload falls to the Icarus-1, a prototype spaceship with enhanced thermal shielding and an advanced artificial intelligence or AI. Sadly, the mission is a failure. In seven years, a second attempt is launched with the Icarus-2. The crew consists of Dr. Robert Coppa, the physicist who is in charge of the final calculations for the stellar payload's deployment and detonation. Captain Kaneda, the focused, determined mission leader, Mace, the engineer who lends military perspective to the mission, Dr. Searle, the ship's counselor and medical officer, Cassie, the pilot who serves as the crew's emotional tether, Trey, the tech-savvy navigator, Harvey, the first officer and communications specialist, and Corazon, the botanist who maintains the oxygen garden that provides both food and carbon to atmosphere recycling during the trip. After 16 months of journey, radio links to Earth start to be disrupted as the ship approaches the sun in the dead zone, a region of solar noise. The crew now has just 24 hours to collect all of their individual thoughts and send each of them off to their loved ones in a final communication packet because the ship entered the dead zone seven days sooner than anticipated. Kappa struggles to express himself clearly and makes multiple efforts, unwittingly running out the clock on Mace. Despite Mace's apologies, there's still open hostility between the two after a fight between Kappa and Mace. The Earth Chamber, which Searle has Mace spend a few hours in, resembles central encounters on Earth. After that, Mace makes amends to Kappa and they start getting along. The ship is only about two-thirds of the way to its goal, the Sun but Corazon points out that the garden has been generating oxygen at better than projected rates, and the ship already has enough oxygen saved up for the delivery and a quarter of the return trip. Searle is interested about what it would be like to see the sun without any filters, because he has grown intrigued by staring out of the ship's viewport at it. Searle instructs Icarus to configure the system for 30 seconds of viewing at that rate when the AI alerts him that he can only endure 3.1% of the real light. The outcome has some type of impact on Cyril, who starts to spend a lot of time in the viewing room and repeats his sun exposures until his skin starts to peel off and blisters appear on his face. In order to learn why the first mission failed and avoid his crew from repeating the same mistakes, Captain Kaneda has been studying the video records of Captain Pinbacker, the captain of Icarus-1. He watches a clip where Pinbacker talks about a little meteor storm that only caused minor damage and is perplexed by Pinbacker's cool response to the incident. Harvey hears a tiny signal from the Icarus, its distress beacon, as the spacecraft approaches Mercury, but only because it was magnified by the iron in Mercury's mass. Captain Kaneda emphasizes to the crew that some people on board Icarus-1 could still be alive and starts the discussion whether the present mission should be changed to check on the Icarus-1's distress beacon. The bomb delivery mission is Mace's top priority, thus they're not pleased with the decision to change their flight path. Dr. Searle affirms his agreement with Mace's assessment but adds that a second payload may be added if the Icarus-1 is diverted. He contends that the Icarus bombs are completely theoretical and that having two would be beneficial if something went wrong with the first one because they have never existed before and have thus never been genuinely exploded either. After several argumentative exchanges, Captain Kaneda ultimately puts an end to them by announcing that he's delegating the decision to Kappa, the ship's nuclear physicist, who is the most knowledgeable person on board in this regard. Being asked to make this choice troubles Kappa. He explains to the captain that he just lacks the knowledge necessary to make a wise and informed choice, and that his only option is to flip a coin. The captain makes Kappa's choice official. The two Icarus craft will collide. Trey determines the course, confirms his accuracy three times, and is happy. To approach the Icarus 1, Trey modifies the Icarus 2's path. Trey does several calculations, but he overlooks one. The requirement to reposition the heat shield that shields the ship from solar radiation. When the computer declares an emergency following minor heat shield damage as a result of Trey's fault, this error is found. Only by departing the spacecraft and performing the necessary repairs in space can the real extent of the damage be determined. Kappa is offered by Mace after Captain Kaneda requests a volunteer to go with him after he forbids the second in command to do so. 
Kappa accepts the implied challenge anyway, and Kaneda permits Kappa to join him on the spacewalk. Cassie shifts the Icarus 2's position to provide Captain Kaneda and Kappa as much shade as she can when they leave the ship in EVA suits to start repairs. She does this with the knowledge that it'll lead to the destruction of the two communication towers required for a subsequent return to Earth. As they continue to circle around the living quarters in and out of the sunshine, the points of the communication towers flame up. Because of the steel rotating and burning ruins of the communications tower, a beam of sunlight is deflected towards the center of the ship and into the oxygen garden, which prompts Cassie to unintentionally start another sequence of events. A fire breaks out, which the ship manages at first, but it quickly gets out of hand and threatens not only the garden but also the entire ship. Corazon rushes to her rapidly burning garden and asks for the entry in the hope that she can save it. But Mace, quickly assessing the situation, realizes that the mission and ship will be lost unless drastic action is taken. So he orders the computer to release all the stored oxygen in the tanks in order to give the fire such a tremendous boost that it'll practically blow itself out, even though he also knows that this will completely destroy the garden. As the mission is threatened by extended exposure, the AI starts to take automated control of the Icarus 2 and returns the heat shield to cover the living space. Because Cassie is trying to prevent the two astronauts from being annihilated through direct sun rays. When Cassie learns that this maneuver would kill the two spacewalkers, she tries to revoke the command, but the AI won't budge. After a brief struggle for control between Cassie and the AI, Cassie finally uses an override command that requires the approval of another crew member. When Cassie asks Mace for his authorization code, he declines because he feels that the mission is worth far more than the lives of Kaneda and Kappa. Harvey hears Cassie's pleading and promptly grants her permission. In defiance of Cassie and Harvey's orders, Mace phones Captain Kaneda directly and requests his help defying them in a move that would kill both Kappa and him. The captain instructs the AI to restart corrective shading and continue with the mission, and the AI does so. Kaneda concurs with Mace that the mission is more essential than his and Kappa's lives. Kaneda tells Kappa to return to the ship as the cover for the two astronauts begins to deteriorate while he fixes the remaining heat shield damage by himself. Kappa complies, and soon after, Kaneda repairs the remaining damage before dying from sun exposure. The astronauts are forced to intercept Icarus 1 since they have lost their oxygen garden. Trey continues to hold himself responsible and is placed on suicide watch. Cyril, Kappa, Maze, and Harvey board Icarus 1 now to find that there is enough food for the journey, a blooming oxygen garden, and a usable payload. However, the ship's computer servers have sustained significant damage, making it impossible for the ship to maneuver. A video log from Pinbacker, now showing symptoms of deformity, reveals that the crew decided to cancel the trip because they thought that God's plan was for humanity to perish. In addition, due to the filter being switched off, the whole crew is discovered charred to death in the viewing room. The remark is made that individuals witnessing the burning crew members would also perish if the Icarus 1 were not concealed by the shield of the Icarus 2. The airlock between the Icarus 1 and the Icarus 2 is unexpectedly damaged, and both spacecraft are torn apart as the crew is conducting their investigation. One EVA suit is discovered, allowing Kappa to return to Icarus 2. Harvey questions why Kappa received the suit, considering his position as captain in the wake of Kaneda's passing. Searle stays behind to manually operate the shafts, while Harvey and Mace hide behind the insulation of the ship to cling on to Kappa as he is propelled into the Icarus 2 and make it inside on their own. Harvey floats off into space and is stuck when Kappa loses control of him during the real journey. It is seen that his body shatters into pieces when it hits the spacecraft and catches fire as it escapes the heat shield. Despite having frostbite, May survives and makes a quick recovery. When Icarus 2 departs, there won't be any sun protection, so Cyril enters Icarus 1's observation chamber to get ready for his demise. Like the Icarus 1 crew, he perishes from burns. Corazon determines how much oxygen they now have and how much more they'll need to finish the task. According to her assessment, there is enough for four out of the five of them to survive and deliver the payload. The AI informs Kappa that until they deliver the cargo, there won't be enough oxygen for everyone to survive. According to the calculations done by Corazon, there should be adequate oxygen for the four crew members who are still alive. Five humans are present aboard the spacecraft according to the AI, with the fifth being in the observation room. Kappa rushes to the observation area where he finds Pinbacker still alive. He has horrific burns all over his body and is obviously mentally ill. He uses his stolen scalpel to cut a wound in Kappa's chest and pursues him around the ship. 
Kappa enters the room with the EVA suits and locks the door. Kappa is imprisoned in the space when Pinbacker pulls the safety lever. Then, much like he did on his own spacecraft, Pinbacker drains the ship's computer servers from their coolant. One seedling is fast emerging from the freshly scorched soil in the burned-out oxygen garden, giving Corazon and the team optimism that they may not only survive but even reach Earth again. Pinbacker murders her as she summons Kappa and Cassie to the chamber. May submerges himself in the coolant and enters the cooling unit to repair the Icarus II's mainframe. His leg is hurt and bleeding after being entangled in the machinery, and he finally freezes to death. Pinbacker also pursues Cassie, who hides in the nuclear payload in the front of the ship. Before dying, Kappa speaks to Mace when he's imprisoned in the EVA suit room. Kappa will have to personally disconnect the nuclear payload from Icarus and fly it directly into the sun. Mace, who's in excruciating pain from the icy coolant, warns Kappa. Kappa leaves the compartment by putting on an EVA suit, using a welding torch to pierce the inner door and opening the outside airlock door. Kappa enters the spacecraft as several of the loose items in Corazon's body fly out of it. He disengages the cargo and makes his way to the ship's front hatch. Kappa utilizes the propulsion system of his EVA suit to fly to the cargo as Icarus 2 and the payload begin to separate. The payload's thrusters start to activate as he approaches it, partially destroying Icarus 2. The remainder of the spacecraft explodes and burns up. Kappa enters the payload to ignite and manually pilot it. He encounters Pinbacker there and discovers Cassie hiding. The two struggle with the insane Pinbacker and manage to get away from him. Kappa successfully ignites the cargo, and as the nuclear reaction gets going, he comes to terms with his demise by gazing into the sun's blazing rays as it becomes closer and closer. Robert Kappa's sister is back on Earth, watching the final message he gave her with her children outside in a snow-covered park. They were successful in their goal. The movie ends as the sun is finally visible and shining stronger than normal over a frozen Sydney harbor. And that's all for today's video. Don't forget to like and subscribe to many such videos. Thanks for watching and take care.